Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and, and forever. forever. We're just re-recording the homily from the other day, which we weren't able to post. And today's reflection is on Franciscan spirituality, and we're going to continue speaking about Our Lady. We'll begin looking at her predestination in the eyes of God and in the plan of God as well. And if someone's worried about using the word predestination, well, we'll just say that St. Paul can use it and we can use it too. It's just a matter of not using it in the, the wrong way, in a Calvinistic type of way. We know that God's works and his words are not contingent and occasional and maybe haphazard like ours. God's works have an eternal weight, an eternal resonance to them. The Lord says in Isaiah 55 verse 11, he says, my word shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I intend and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When God said, it's not good for man to be alone, let us make for him a helper similar to him, Genesis 2, 18, and he gave life to Eve, Adam's companion and mother of all the living by nature, as we read in Genesis 3, verse 20. When he did that, he actually had Our Lady in mind. Mary, the partner and collaborator with Jesus and mother of all the living by grace, not by nature. So what we would call the biblical types of man and woman, meaning the models, the exemplars in which we've all been made, they're not Adam and Eve from whom we descend according to the flesh. The models we were built on are Jesus and Mary. It's through Jesus and Mary that we have that life by which, as the apostle says, we are born of God, Genesis, excuse me, John 1 verse 13. It's through them that we have God's grace, which builds on our human nature, but far surpasses it. Again, Eve was a prototype of our Blessed Mother. And all women are meant to reflect the image of their spiritual mother, Mary, just like all men are meant to be a reflection of Christ. Jesus and Mary aren't on the exact same level in the sense that Jesus Christ is the masterpiece of the Father. He's the one who alone satisfies, every, always satisfies the Father in everything, as St. Francis writes in his first rule. But the Virgin Mary from all eternity is united to the mystery of Christ by one single decree of predestination, as Pius IX said, and as we mentioned the other day. St. Mary's predestination is independent from all that of all the other creatures and depends solely on Jesus' predestination with Jesus and subordinated to him. Mary is the exemplar and final cause of all creation, meaning that she and Jesus are the pattern and the model on which we've all been created and we were created for them as well. So before turning his gaze to angels and men and independent of sin, the love of the Creator looked upon the couple and type of every perfection, meaning Jesus and Mary, first. They are the cornerstone of all the works of God ad extra. The 18th century Franciscan Carlo del Moral writes, God, in fact, willed and decreed before any created thing, Christ the Lord and his most beloved mother. Even better, God willed to create everything for Jesus and Mary as the aim or purpose of their existence so that before all created things, God first willed the mother and the son." Unquote. This is a clear and classic example of the maxim of Blessed John Duns Scotus, which all the faithful sons of St. Francis embrace. The maxim is to attribute to the Virgin that which is most excellent, says Blessed John Duns Scotus. So we'll say a few things about Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. The perfection of Mary is a reflected light, meaning it's a participated light, a light that she participates in, which is the light of Jesus. Mary receives everything from Jesus, but among the elect, she is the first. And among the perfections that she receives and welcomes into herself is the maximum that a simple creature can attain. So says St. Bernardine of Siena. No creature can attain greater perfection than her. 
If in Jesus the fullness of the divinity dwells bodily, as St. Paul says in Colossians 2, 9, then in Mary dwells the fullness of every created grace, a fullness that excludes every sin, every stain, every shadow. The incarnate word truly reflected his splendor on her. There was no obstacle to God's grace in Mary. That's why she is the Immaculate One. This is how God predestined her in his eternal design as well. She's the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars on her head, as we read in Revelation 12, verse 1. The woman whom the infernal dragon Satan fights against in vain. Mary's the woman of the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel that we read in Genesis 3.15. The one who's in perpetual enmity with the serpent, the woman who with her seed will crush the head of that hellish snake. The Most High, Holy, Immaculate God introduced her in time some 2,000 years ago, but he had already eternally elected her holy and immaculate even before time began. It was Blessed John Duns Scotus, the first knight of the Immaculate, who fully addressed Mary's Immaculate Conception. Even the Franciscans, Blessed Raymond Lull and theologian William of Ware, who both had speculated on this privilege of Our Lady, even they weren't able to overcome the questions of the universality of original sin and the necessity for all men to be redeemed in Christ. It was Scotus, the subtle doctor, who managed to accomplish that. Scotus taught that being immaculate didn't subtract Mary from the redemptive mediation of her son. Rather, she's immaculate in particular because she's the only creature who enjoys the mediation of Christ in the fullest, most perfect measure. If you were to ask who benefited most from Christ's redemptive mediation, the answer is our Blessed Mother, Mary. Jesus is for her the most perfect mediator because as Scotus says, quote, it's more excellent, it's a more excellent benefit to preserve someone from either evil rather than to permit them to fall into evil and then liberate them from it, unquote. So if Our Lady wasn't technically redeemed, she was preserved, however. And if I were to choose, if I wanted my mother to first fall into trouble and then have her pull out of, be pulled out of it, or if I wanted her to be saved from having to fall into any mess in the beginning, I'd prefer the second. I'd prefer that she be saved from having to fall into any trouble. That's what God did for our Blessed Mother. The Franciscan theologian Ludovico Collini da Castelplanio says, Mary, quote, in the divine plan is first the daughter of God, then the daughter of man. In her purpose, she's first mother of God and then daughter of man, since she's only the daughter of man because she must be the daughter of God, he says. So the existence and the predestination of Mary depends only on Christ and not on the sin of Adam. As much as I like the old Christmas carol or Christmas hymn, Adam lay bonded, uh, I like that hymn, but when it says there that if Adam, Adam haven't, hadn't eaten the apple, then Our Lady would have ne never been heavenly queen, I don't buy into that one. It's not Franciscan at all. God actually only permits sin because of the glory of redemption that will come from it, the redemption of which Our Lady is partner and collaborator. But she was predestined to be queen, sin or no sin. Sin, therefore, can't stain Jesus and Mary, the two elect creatures, the first willed by God, from whom comes to us that grace of divine adoption. So between Jesus and Mary, there is the tightest bond possible, the deepest intimacy of relatives. Mary receives her very existence and her very being from her son because he's the exemplar, meaning the model. He's the final and meritorious cause of her predestination. And in turn, Jesus, according to his human nature, receives his being from his mother. And in the person of the word, he unifies it in an indissoluble way, that which he had received from her to his divine nature. Takes the human nature, unites it to his divine nature, essentially forever from now on.
The price of the universal justification and sanctification comes from Christ on the cross, but it's a price paid through the blood that Jesus received from his mother. And that blood would, makes its way back before everyone else to that conception of his mother, which is where the blood of Jesus actually originated from. In this way, by the power of the Father, foreseeing the merits of the Son, and by the love of the Holy Spirit, Mary was immune from original sin. And up till now, the Immaculate Conception is the greatest conquest of Franciscan theology, which the Church has made its own and codified to. And it was two great sons of St. Francis, Blessed John Duns Scotus and Blessed Pius IX, who made this happen. The one Scotus, doctor of the Immaculate, the other Pius IX, third order member, the Pope of the Immaculate. The conquest of Our Lady's co-redemption being proclaimed is still somewhere along the horizon, hopefully not too far off. So let's ask Our Lady for the grace to understand her predestination better so that we can love her all the more. And let's keep in mind that we, that all of us, were created in the image and likeness not only of God, but also of Jesus and Mary, our true parents in many ways. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now, now and, and forever. forever.